<laughs> that I hope that you know you enjoyed. And now we're tackling a subject, and it's a it's 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 one that basically a lot of people could think this would be blasphemy. You know, was Jesus a myth? Ooh, can you see them in all of the little churches? You can see their steeples rocking back and forth. You know, yeah, how could you? That, but see, that is an earthquake. That's what earthquake means. It means a shaking down of old traditional concepts. The foundations start to crack and you start to think in new ways. That's what earthquake means. But so what right do I have then to discuss that? Was Jesus a myth? I mean, you know, Christmas and Easter and all of these things, dying on the cross and all of this stuff. And then you turn around and say, was he a myth? That's hard for a lot of people. A lot of people would not sit still. I mean, if I was in a more public place, I'm sure a lot of people would be up and headed for the door already because I'm going to even consider such a subject. But let me show you where I'm coming from in broaching the subject at all. Go to page 782 in your Bible, okay? And that will put you at Matthew chapter 7, page 782, Matthew chapter 7. And, and for those of you at home, there has to be some justification. I'll tell you quite frankly, I have no business standing in front of you and addressing such a question as this without some type of authority, because that's, you know, that wouldn't be right. That, as I, you know, this is, this is a very sanctified type of belief affecting millions of people, and I come along, who the heck am I to come along and say, was this a myth? But, but this is the basis upon which I choose to do this. In Matthew chapter 7, and if you look at verse 7, Jesus Christ says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. So what's being said here is question. You know, and that's the most important thing because that's the way you begin to understand. And you've got the first thing that I would do if I was to sit down with Jesus Christ and say, Hey, what about this? I mean, what do you mean telling everybody they could do better than you? What do you mean telling everybody you couldn't do anything? And how come you got all of these churches asking you for this and that, and you're telling in the book, don't ask me for I mean, what, what the heck is it? What, and, and come on, tell me, you know, what about the virgin birth? I mean, really, now, you know, because I, I'd ha that's the kind of person I am. And I would have to ask, what's this all about? I mean, there's a way of asking somebody in power, but there's, there's still the, the, the need to ask and to question these types of things. And here Jesus then gives me an opening, and he says, go ahead and ask. He says it right here, go ahead and ask and, and it will be given to you. So that gives us then the, um, the need to question. See, we remember, remember this morning the Apostle Paul said, uh, get rid of this thing of faith because, you know, blind faith just leaves you sitting there and looking back on all of the carnage that's happened all over the world for the last 2,000 years and to say, well, maybe it's because you haven't asked, maybe because we don't understand what this is all about. So let's start to look at, it, at, at things. And, and, and what you're going to do is walk out of here questioning Jesus. You're going to walk out of here wondering, you know, what is this about? And that's very important. That's extremely necessary if you're to achieve the point of being an individual who is able to uh, 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 attack any subject, you know, as a mature person saying, hey, I have questions about this. On the other hand, if you are a religionist who blindly falls into the Methodist church, Catholic church, Baptist church, Buddhist church, whatever, because the rest of the mob does and you don't question anything, then you're lost. You're absolutely lost. Where will you go when you start to address these things and start to ask the questions? That's basically up to you. Let's, let's look at a few things here and maybe see why the question is even relevant and why it should be asked and why you should have been taught this in your early years if you went to religious school or if you came up through a church. Why has the churches and the institutions seen fit to keep this from you? Um, we discussed this before, but Jesus Christ was a Nazar, N-A-Z-A-R. A Nazar means a separated one, separated one. You could say Buddhist, you could say Hindu, one who separates from that which is the, the, the carnal consciousness and moves into to that which is the divine consciousness, separates from the flesh. And that's what it means. Now, of course, that is no good for Christianity because people are not supposed to separate from the lower mind. They're simply supposed to follow that which is the doctrine or the ordained religious beliefs of the, of the group, of the organization. Okay? So... In order to do that, something had to be invented in the Bible 
to give some credence to the fact that he was called Nazar. How do we explain this? Because right away, if, if you get to understand the mystical evidences that accrue throughout the ancient scriptures, you realize right away that you're dealing here with a person who's a mystic. You have anybody that's called a Nazar, it's a mystic. One who separates from the lower consciousness, elevates himself into a higher degree of consciousness. Now you've got a mystic, and a mystic and a Christian do not go hand in hand because a mystic is an individual who follows to the beat of a different drummer while a Christian is one who follows the group or the organization. Okay. So what's invented in order to justify this? Go to page 778 in your Bible. You get to Matthew chapter 2, page 778, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, it says, And he came, and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So now we've got him dwelling in Nazareth, and that fulfills the prophecy. We've got to put that in there. Fulfills the prophecy that he shall be called. Now, why is this? This is a brand new thing here. And it's, he shall be called a Nazarene. All right? Now, there's problems here. I mean, you're in a church, so most people in a church will blindly accept this. Okay, I, I'll buy that. He shall be called a Nazarene, and this shall fulfill the prophecy. And the reason he shall be called a Nazarene is because he lived in Nazareth. So we're getting to this point about Nazar, okay? The only problem with this, the word Nazareth and the word Nazarene never appear anywhere in the Old Testament. There never was a prophecy concerning Nazareth or a Nazarene. doesn't exist. Somebody made it up. It was made up in the Bible. The word Nazarite and the word Nazar appear in the Old Testament, which mean the separated one. But nowhere in any scripture does it say anything about Nazareth or Nazarene. No matter how you look, you'll never find the word Nazareth, you'll never find the word Nazarene, and there is no prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. There's no prophecy concerning anybody that they shall be called a Nazarene or, or come from Nazareth. So what happens here? It's never used. There never was such a prophecy. It was made up. And so when I see something like this, then I have a legitimate right to say, wait a minute here. And you have a legitimate right when you leave this building or when you turn this television cell off to check it out yourself. That's your responsibility. Because if you're like the rest of them who go to church, you say, oh, hallelujah, uh, I believe it. And you never stop to look and say, is he telling the truth? Look it up. Check it out. You go into concordances. Look up the word Nazareth or Nazarene in the Old Testament where prophecies come from. It doesn't exist. Somebody put it in there to justify the fact of him being a Nazar. And there's something else. And that is at the time that Jesus lived in Galilee, there was no place called Nazareth. It didn't even exist. The encyclopedia of the Bible is quoted as this. We cannot assert that there was a city called Nazareth in Jesus' time. Yet, he is Jesus of Nazareth. So when I hear something like this, then I go back to what Jesus says, hey, seek, ask, knock, because you've got people fooling around with this book. And they're putting things in there to keep the crowds controlled. Okay? And a lot of people would even get highly outraged. There are people that if they hear this from me, they would really get ticked off at me. Never get ticked off at the ones who created this hocus pocus in order to keep them captive. Okay. Now, if you look at Jesus Christ, you look at the fact that this Jesus Christ is a, a strange character because of the fact that his life duplicates the life of the sun. We've done this a hundred times, but just let me show you. On December the 21st, the sun goes through the constellation Crooks. The sun is crucified on a cross constellation on December the 21st. December the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun is entombed in the bowels of the earth. It's called the winter solstice. Three nights, three days in the tomb. Exactly like Jesus Christ. December the 25th, by the trajectory of the earth, the sun is born. That is the birth of God's sun. It has been that way since the sun first was set on fire. It's always been that way. 
30 years after Jesus is born, he enters into that which is the water man, John the Baptist. 30 days after the sun enters into uh, 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 December the 25th, it enters into the sign Aquarius, the water man. Coincidence? I don't think so. Right after Jesus enters into the sign of the water man, when he enters into the, to the water of John the Baptist, what does he do? He selects the fishermen. As soon as the sun moves out of the sign of the water man, where does it go? To the sign of the fishes, Pisces. Jesus then becomes the Lamb of God that takes away because the Son takes care of that which is the Lamb, Aries, and consumes the Lamb, and then sits at the right hand because in the northern hemisphere, the Son sits at the eastern sky, and summer comes to the world. And all of this happens in September when the Son is born out of the constellation Virgo, born of a virgin. And Jesus winds up being King of Kings and Lord of Lords, August Leo, concludes the journey. Jesus Christ's birth and the movement of the sun are identical. But the sun was around billions of years before Jesus entered onto the scene and was doing the same thing. Getting born of a virgin, getting crucified, being three days and three nights in the tomb, being born in December, going through Aquarius, the water man, going to the Pisces, consuming the Lamb of God, which takes away the cold of the weather, sitting at the right hand of the Father. The sun does it every year and has done it every year since the beginning of the earth. Now why? I'm only asking... Why does Jesus' life duplicate the life of the Son? And if that wasn't enough in the book of Revelation, he identifies himself by saying, Thus saith the Amen. Amen, Ra is the name of the Egyptian sun god. So what do you have here? You have a continuation of ancient sun god worship. Otherwise, it couldn't duplicate the movement of the sun. So it's interesting. Now there is something very strange about the life of Jesus. After he is born, he disappears. Except for a single incident in Luke, there is no mention of him from the time of his birth until he's 30 years old. Where did he go? In Matthew, he is born, and the next thing you see is John the Baptist, 30 years later. In Mark, there's not even a mention of his virgin birth. It starts with John the Baptist. In Luke, there is a mention of him at the age of 12 talking to the rabbis in the temple. But remember something about the book of Luke. It was written by someone far removed from the story. There was no guy named Luke who wrote that. <laughs> as far as the history of uh, John, there's no mention of his virgin birth. And, he, and John starts at the age of 30. So here we have. The fact that a Jesus character of some sort evidently existed, but his influence certainly didn't extend very far until missionaries started to preach his resurrection, and he was soon coming on clouds of power, and they got all the savages to run around and, and give up their religions and all of this kind of stuff, and power started to grow. But yet there is something that you have to look at. When you look at the Bible, and I've showed you a lot of error, a lot of mistakes in the Bible, here's a glowing one. Let me show you one that was put in the Bible comes from the lips of Jesus Christ, and literally is wrong. Watch. Go to page 786. Page 786, you look at Matthew chapter 10. Okay. Matthew chapter 10. And look at verse 23. And what does it say? This is Jesus Christ talking. When they persecute you, flee into another city, for I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. He still hasn't come. Never happened. Literally, it never happened. What do you do with that? Do you just sit there and say, Hallelujah? And even when you're saying, Hallelujah, do you know you're giving veneration to the God of Muhammad, Allah? That's why you say hallelujah. Why shouldn't somebody just say, hey, okay. Hallelujah, that's his name. No. But shouldn't somebody say, no, you know, excuse me, pastor. <laughs> excuse me. There's a mistake here in the Bible. There's a mistake. There's a literal error. But you know what? There is not, you know, there's not one of you sitting in this room, there's not one of you sitting in this television, who if you heard something from a friend or a relative would just jump right up and say, oh, you're full of baloney. But there's not one who will stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, this is full of baloney, this never happened. But it never did. Never happened. 
So we have here the greatest life that's ever been recorded, affecting more people than anyone in the history of the world, say maybe Buddha or Krishna, and there is an account of three years of his life. 